Welcome to the Wisdom That Breathes channel. Across all our platforms, we try to share wisdom which is relevant and accessible to everyone. But on this particular platform, we go deeper into some of the ancient principles found within the scriptures. If you find some of the terminology difficult or inaccessible, then go over to our Keshava Swami YouTube channel where you'll be able to find other content which is perhaps more relatable. Thank you and enjoy the wisdom that breathes. So welcome, Hare Krishna everyone. So today we're reading from the Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 9. Text number, uh, so this chapter is entitled, The Most Confidential Knowledge. And today we're reading from text number 2. It's quite a famous verse. And uh, even if you don't know this verse, it's quite simple. So I'll say line by line and then you can repeat after me. Is that okay? Raja Vidya Raja Guyam Pavitra Midamutama Pratyaksha Vagavam Dharmya Susukam Kartum Avyaya Raja Vidya Raja Pavitra Midamutama Pratyaksha Vagamam Dharmya Susukam Kartum Avyaya Raja Vidya Raja Guyam Pavitra Midamutama Pratyaksha Vagamam Dharmya Susukam Kartum Avyaya Is it there? Yeah, oh, okay. I was thinking like, wow, you guys are good. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's on the board, <laughs> cheating. <laughs> yes, please, if someone wants to repeat. Susukam Gautam Avyayam One of the ladies Rajavidya the king of education Rajaguyam the king of confidential knowledge Pavitram the purest Idam this Uttamam transcendental Pratyaksha by direct experience Avagamam understood Dharmyam the principle of religion Susukam very happy Kartum to execute Avyayam everlasting Translation and purport by His Divine Grace Lady Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada Ki Translation This knowledge is the king of education 
the most secret of all secrets. It is the purest knowledge and because it gives direct perception of the self by realization, it is the perfection of religion. It is everlasting and it is joyfully performed. So the purple is very long, it's like uh, two, four, nearly five or six pages. So I'll just read the first paragraph and then let's see, we may pick out parts of it. So the first paragraph of the purple. This chapter of the Bhagavad Gita is called the King of Education because it is the essence of all doctrines and philosophies explained before. <coughs> Among the principal philosophers in India are Gautama, Kanada, Kapila, Yajnavalkya, Shandilya, and Vaishvanara. And finally, there is Vyasadeva, the author of Vedanta Sutra. So there is no dearth of knowledge in the field of philosophy or transcendental knowledge. Now the Lord says that this ninth chapter is the king of all such knowledge, the essence of all knowledge that can be derived from the study of the Vedas and different kinds of philosophy. It is the most confidential because confidential or transcendental knowledge involves understanding the difference between the soul and the body. And the king of all confidential knowledge culminates in devotional service. Shila Prabhupada ki jaya. Oma jnana timirandhasya jnana njana shalakaya. Chakshodam militam yena tasmai shri gurave namaha. Shri chaitanya mano bhishtam stapitam yena bhutale. Swayam rupa kadamayam dadati svapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Tapadakamalan Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Rupanathan Vitantam Sajivam Sadvetam Sagadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakam Vitamsha He Krishna Karma Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Takta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrinda Vaneshwari Vishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpataru Yascha Kripa Siddhu Vyayavacha Patitanam Pavanendu Vaishnavetyo Namo Nama Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Advaita Gadadar Shri Gauda Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare <coughs> Forgive me, I have a bit of a bad throat. <coughs> so uh, here we're reading this beautiful verse. Um, to the background of police sirens <laughs> it's like good combination uh, and this verse is incredibly important because Krishna is introducing the beauty of the ninth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita the Bhagavad Gita consists of 18 chapters and it's said that the Bhagavad Gita is split into three sections sometimes is compared to a jewel box. A jewel box has a base, a jewel box has a lid, but then the jewel box hopefully has a jewel inside of it. The base of the jewel box is said to be the first six chapters of the Bhagavad Gita because they're all about karma yoga. Karma yoga means how to live in this world. That's the basis, that's the foundation, because every single day you have to show up. You have to show up to work, you have to show up to study, you have to show up to look after your family. Every day you can't 
survive without doing something in this world. So the basis of life is karma yoga, understanding how to function in this world. These are the first six chapters of the Gita. The final last six chapters of the Gita, 13 to 18, are known as Jnana Yoga and they're like the lid. Because the lid protects you. So the final six chapters of the Bhagavad Gita are known as Jnana Yoga. Or the Yoga of Knowledge, the Yoga of Wisdom. Because while you're going through this world, we may think many things are protecting us, but the ultimate thing that's protecting us is knowledge. If you have knowledge of yourself, knowledge of the world, knowledge of karma, knowledge of the modes of nature, then while you're living in this world, you'll be protected. But inside that jewel box, the middle six chapters of the Bhagavad Gita, right in the middle, that is where the jewel is. And those six chapters are all about bhakti, bhakti yoga, uh, love. Because yes, you can understand how to live in this world. You can understand knowledge which will help you to remain detached from the difficulties of this world. But even if you're successful and at the same time deta detached from the difficulties, ultimately we want to experience love. Everyone wants to experience love. And so these middle six chapters of the Bhagavad Gita are about love. And the right in the middle of those six chapters is chapter number nine. So it's like the middle of the middle. It's like, I don't know if you ever use, ever ate eclairs. <laughs> Did you ever eat chocolate eclairs? So the best thing was like, it was nice also on the outside, it was also sweet. But then when you get right to the middle, that's where the sweetest of the sweet comes. So the Bhagavad Gita is like that. The ninth chapter is considered the Raja Vidya, the most confidential knowledge, the king of knowledge. See, a king, <clears throat> what makes a king a king? Let me ask you. If I was to ask you, what one quality makes a king a king? What would you say it is? As a kingdom. <laughs> exactly. And to get a kingdom, what do you have to do? You have to fight a war. You basically have to conquer. A king is basically someone who's conquered. Because they fought a war and they've got a kingdom. So anyone who conquers is a king. So why is this considered the king of all knowledge? It's very, very interesting terminology Krishna uses. Once there was a sage, and the sage was meditating in his hermitage in the forest, um, and then this king walked in. And so the king was looking around like at this hermitage, there was nothing in there except the sage meditating. So naturally for a king who has so much material opulence, he was looking at the stage thinking, you know, like, what did you do with your life? You know. <laughs> so finally the sage opened his eyes and the king looked at the sage and uh, the king looked at him and said, who are you? To the sage. Jai Shishi Jagannath Baladev Subhadra Maharani Ki so the sage looked at the king and uh, the king looked at the sage and said, Who are you? And the sage, without the blink of an eyelid, looked straight back at the king and said, I'm a king. He <laughs> said, What do you mean you're a king? The king felt insulted by that. He appreciated his title as a king. So he said, What do you mean? So the king looked at the sage and he said, If you're a king, where are your armies? And the sage looked back at the king. Didikshava karunika surida sarvadehinam ajata shatrava shanta shadava sadhubhushana. The king said, Where are your armies? The sage looked back at the king and the sage said, I don't have any enemies and therefore I don't need any armies. The king was like, Wow. 
Then the king looked at the sage and said, If you're a king, where's your kingdom? The sage looked at the king and said, Because my mind, my words, my activities are absorbed in the divine, therefore, even though I'm living in this world, I'm not really living in this world. And therefore, where's my kingdom? My kingdom is beyond this physical realm. You can't see my kingdom that I live in. That's a sacred space. The king looked at the, yo, uh, the sage and said, If you're a king, where's all your wealth? And the yogi looked back at the sage, looked back at the king and said, Santushta satatam yogi yatatma nishchaya. The yogi said, I'm completely satisfied in my heart. The richest person is not the one who has the most. The richest person is the one who needs the least. And therefore the yogi said, my wealth is that I have internal satisfaction. That's my treasury. And in that moment, the king realized that every single thing he prided himself upon was actually indicative of an <coughs> internal vacuum. He prided himself in his wealth because he didn't have inner satisfaction. He prided himself in his armies, but he realized that I've created so many enemies and therefore I need armies. He prided himself in his kingdom because he realized I haven't found any sacred space to live in, therefore I have to conquer more and more physical land. And the king realized that actually he's the real king. Because someone can conquer land but who can conquer ignorance? Who can conquer their own mind and senses? Who can conquer their own pride? Who can conquer God? The person that can conquer these things, they are the real king. And therefore here Krishna says to Arjun, this knowledge is the Raja Vidya, is the king of all knowledge. Because through this knowledge, one will be able to conquer over ignorance, conquer over their mind and senses, conquer over pride. This knowledge will even empower you to conquer God. Conquer God by pure love. And therefore, Anyone who interfaces with this knowledge immediately becomes the greatest king. So Krishna says, Raja Vidya is the king of all knowledge, Raja Guyam. And although it's accessible to everyone, it's the most secret of all secrets. Because most knowledge in the world is understood through one's intellect, through one's IQ through one's ability to memorize and absorb information. That's basically how the modern educational system works. I also went to university. And basically what you have to do is uh, learn the art of how to memorize the past exam papers. <laughs> if you manage that, then usually you can get through most academic education. Because it's all just about processing information, memorizing and learning techniques by which you can jump through the hoops so that you can tick the boxes and then you get all the letters behind your name. But spiritual knowledge is not like that. Spiritual knowledge is known as Raja Guya. It's very, very confidential. It's very, very secret. Because one can't understand it simply by reading books. One can't even understand it simply by listening to lectures. Through that, one will get some insight. But ultimately, this knowledge is only awakened within a heart. 
which is completely humble and a heart which is uh, completely um, attracted to serving God. Therefore, in the fourth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Sa evaya maya tedya yoga prokta puratana bhakto sime sakacheti rahasyam ketadutamam this uh, supreme science is very, very confidential and it can only be understood by Bhakto Sime Sakacheti, one who has a friendly spirit and one who is uh, a devotee. So it's very, very secret. It's not just formulas of memorization, but this knowledge requires a change of consciousness and then one will be able to uh, grasp it. Then in the second line of the verse, Krishna says, Pavitram, this knowledge is the purest knowledge. You see, in the world today, you don't know what knowledge to trust. <laughs> Nowadays, there are so many conspiracy theories, isn't it? Uh, you know, did man land on the moon? Did Shakespeare really write all the works that bear his name? Did aliens land in Area 51? <laughs> um, all of these conspiracies. Did 9-11, was that the Americans that orchestrated it themselves? When you turn on the television, when you read the newspapers, when you browse the social media feeds, how much can you trust this knowledge? Is it really pure? Is it really coming from a pure source? Is it coming from someone who has no motivation? Nowadays, you can't be sure about anything because knowledge doesn't come from a pure source and knowledge is not given to you with a pure intention. Therefore, in this world, it's very difficult to find pure knowledge. Every knowledge is somewhat contaminated. Right? People are just trying to make money, basically. Like one person wrote a book, and it became a bestseller. And then he wrote another book, in which he basically refuted everything he said in the first book. <laughs> And that book became an even bigger bestseller. <laughs> this is the way the world works, full of cheating. People give knowledge, and then they contradict that knowledge, and then they glorify it even more. Because in this world, there's no pure knowledge. So Krishna says this knowledge is pure, because it's coming from a pure source, it's delivered to you without deviation, and the reason why it's given to you is for your ultimate well-being. And if you practice this knowledge, then you'll become purified. So for all of these reasons, this knowledge of Krishna consciousness of Bhagavad Gita is known as Pavitram. It's uh, very, very pure. And then Krishna says in the third line, Pratyakshava gamam dharmyam. This knowledge doesn't just remain theoretical. This knowledge, if you apply it in your life and you practice it according to how Krishna has prescribed, then you will actually directly perceive it. This is not a religion. This is not a faith. This is not a belief. This is actually spiritual science. Sometimes people think spirituality and science are two completely different things. But actually, spirituality can be scientific. Here in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna gives us a hypothesis of who we are, who God is, how to connect to God. And then Krishna gives us an experiment and says, if you perform this experiment, then A, B, C, D, E, F, G should happen to you in your life. And then if you do it, there's an observation. So it's not that we practice and we live the Bhagavad Gita and then we you know, cross all of our fingers and toes and we close our eyes and at the end of life we hope that we did the right thing. As you practice it step by step, in every stage of your spiritual journey, you'll begin to realize this knowledge, you'll begin to contact God, you'll be, begin to actually perceive 
all of these things to be true. And then Krishna says, Susukam is joyful, is happy. When you do this, it's not this like heavy religious knowledge that makes your life like completely restricted and miserable. But it's very, very beautiful knowledge. Yes, it's knowledge that sometimes takes some effort to practice, but ultimately it's knowledge that will make you very, very joyful because this knowledge will make you free. It will make you free from your material desires. It will make you free from your material attachments. It will make you free from all your lamentations. It will free you from all your fears. It will free you from lust, anger, greed, envy. And all of these things are basically imprisoning us in our own life. So people think uh, freedom is the ability to go out and do whatever you want to do. But real freedom means to be free from all of these things. Your material desires, your material attachments, your material emotions. Because while we have all of these things, we can never really experience the joy of life. Uh, you can have everything. But if we're dominated by envy towards others, we'll never quite feel very, very joyful. And so Krishna says here that uh, this knowledge is joyfully performed because this is the knowledge which will actually uh, free you from uh, all of these uh, things which prevent you from experiencing the beauty of life. And so here uh, Krishna is explaining in this beautiful chapter the most confidential knowledge. The Bhagavad Gita is telling us um, the most beautiful thing. All other types of knowledge in the world may help you in the journey of life. But the Bhagavad Gita and this knowledge helps you to understand what is the ultimate goal that you're aiming for. You see, most people go through life, but they have no sense of what they're walking towards. They have no sense of what the ultimate goal is. They have no sense of why we're here, where we're meant to go, how to find happiness. So the Bhagavad Gita first uh, gives us this bigger picture. And when we have this bigger picture, then all the other types of knowledge that we attain in the world can then be utilized <coughs> towards that bigger picture, and then they become useful. Therefore, Srila Prabhupada said, all the knowledge in the world is like many, many zeros. And if you line all of those zeros up, the net result is it's still zero. But when you line all of those zeros up and you put a one before it, then it becomes a huge number. And that one before all of the other knowledge is the Raja Vidya, the king of all knowledge. And that knowledge is the Bhagavad Gita. And therefore when you grasp this knowledge, then every other type of knowledge in the world uh, becomes useful in your endeavor for happiness. But if you don't have this knowledge, then all of that other knowledge won't amount to very much at all. And therefore, uh, this is the first knowledge which needs to be uh, grasped. Okay, let me stop there without giving a long, long lecture. And just see whether any of you may have any questions or comments or if there's anything else that I mentioned that you would like to uh, know more about. Does anyone? Yes. last six chapters are considered to be uh, in Jnana Yoga, but we also know that the uh, 18th chapter is the confusion of Bhagavad Gita, so, uh, and confusion of Bhagavad Gita is Bhakti, so how do we understand this? And yeah. I, I wanted also to ask this question, for example, in the fourth chapter, for him, that he knows about transcendental <coughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> 
Yes, yeah, so uh, it seems that there is bhakti uh, outside of these middle six chapters as well. So how do we understand that? Yes, actually uh, what the acharyas uh, explain is that <coughs> karma and jnan, unless they're Jai Shri Shri Jagannath Balade Subhadra Maharani Ki Shri Bhavanitai Ki uh, karma yoga and jnana yoga, unless they are touched by some element of bhakti, there's no life even to them. And therefore, even karma yoga and jnana yoga, they have to be combined with some level of bhakti or devotion to give them life. And therefore, one finds indication of bhakti uh, in many places outside of the middle six chapters of the Bhagavad Gita, not just the fourth chapter, in practically every chapter. In the sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, for example, Krishna says, Yogi nam api sarve sham madgate nantaratmana shraddhavan bhajate yo maam same yukta mataha. Of all yogis, the bhakti yogi is the highest. Um, uh, you know, in the second chapter, Krishna will explain the same thing about bhakti. Um, so, in many places, bhakti is explained, including the 18th chapter as well, which is the conclusion. But the idea is that, broadly speaking, the emphasis of bhakti teachings are found within the middle six chapters of the Gita. That's where bhakti is most... Uh, uh, elucidated in most detail um, and, and so like that is that okay? that makes sense, yeah yes <coughs> Hare Krishna thank you Maharaj for that uh, short and sweet class um, yeah, you spoke obviously about uh, Raja Vidya, gaining all knowledge, um, and I wanted to know how uh, this king of all knowledge applies uh, to people's uh, people of different faiths or people of different uh, like spiritual paths. Um, whether this, how this uh, sort of it seems like universal knowledge can be applied to people's different paths in a way. Um, maybe you could clarify. Yeah, so this is the king of all knowledge and we can say there are two ways of seeing it. This is the king of all knowledge because number one, in general, knowledge of the soul, God, the world we're living in and our relationship with God, this kind of spiritual knowledge is the most important knowledge because it's the most confidential knowledge because as I mentioned when we understand those basic things then every other knowledge that we have can be utilized towards that and therefore this is the first knowledge to understand who am I who is God what is this world what is my relationship with him so one way to define this is the most uh, confidential knowledge is in that sense that it tells you the bigger answers of life to the, the answers to the biggest questions but the other reason why this is the most confidential knowledge is because it reveals the most intimate nature of God what this chapter reveals is not just who you are who is God what's your relationship with him but what this chapter relates to the reader, to what Krishna relates to Arjuna in this chapter, is the most confidential aspect of God's personality. Because in this chapter, what Krishna teaches Arjuna is how he becomes conquered by his devotees. Because later on in this chapter number 9, Krishna will recite very, very famous verses. Patram pushpam phalam toyam yome bhakti aprayachati tadaham bhakti uparitam ashnami prayatatmana. Krishna will say, My relationship with my devotee is so pure that even if my devotee offers me a leaf, a flower, fruit, or water, but they offer it with love, 
I become conquered by that love. Later on, Krishna will say in this chapter, Manmana Bhagamad Bhakto Madhyaji Mam Namaskuru. Krishna will show how his devotees become so intimately connected with him in love that their mind, their uh, physical faculties, their uh, entire being is dedicated to God. So this, the other side of why this chapter is the king of education, king of all knowledge, is because it reveals uh, the most intimate relationship of love between the soul and God. So how does this relate to what you're asking? Different religions, we can say, are all giving confidential knowledge. Because different religions are all teaching their practitioners that you're not this body, you're the soul. All religions are teaching the practitioners that this is not your true home. There's another world beyond this world. All religions are teaching their uh, followers that you know, there are certain spiritual processes which allow you to connect to God. So in that sense, all religions are confidential. However, in the second sense of how uh, intimate the relationship between the devotee and God is and how God can be conquered, this is only really revealed in the Vedic revelation. And therefore, is confidential, this knowledge, in the sense that this intimate understanding of who God is and how to touch God's heart and how to relate to God in the most intimate way, that is only found in the Vedic revelation. In other religions, they will teach you about God, they will teach you about the soul, but they may not teach you how to have this much of an intimate connection. And so... In one sense, we can say all religions give confidential knowledge. And in another sense, we can say the Vedic revelation gives the most confidential knowledge. Does that help? Make sense? Yes. Thank you for your wonderful lecture. And uh, you, you talked about that all this knowledge uh, are just zeros and if there is not Krishna with this then it's uh, <coughs> has not no value and I'm thinking about my preaching work how can I have compassion for example with a football player who is very beautiful successful he he can do what he really likes and a lot of people are following him and I, f I feel like he has a lot of fun and of course it's temporary but how can I really see it's just zeros that uh, one is missing. <coughs> so sometimes we see people have knowledge, they have success, they have facility, and they may not necessarily have God in their life, but they seem to be having a good time. They seem to be quite happy and content with life. So how can we see? So what's your question exactly? So that one is missing actually, that it's nothing. Yeah, so how can we actually see that they have nothing when it seems like they're doing pretty okay? Is that is that your question? Yeah. <coughs> to say that there is no happiness in this material world and no pleasure, I think, would be a little strange. <laughs> right. Clearly, if someone goes on holiday to the Bahamas or something, there's some pleasure there. Right? I'm sure me and you would also derive a little bit of pleasure there. Right? <laughs> Naturally, if someone is a football player and they're in a you know, big match and then they score a goal and the whole stadium is shouting, there's some happiness there. I mean, surely... So I think if we try to begin to sit here and say there's no pleasure, no happiness in the material world, then maybe uh, we're being a little fanatical. But what we're saying is that the quality of that happiness, the sustainability of that happiness, and the depth of that happiness is severely limited. In other words, we're not saying that people don't experience some pleasure in the world. But that pleasure, ultimately, 
it will become frustrated. It will either fade or it will backfire. You see, when you try to become happy on the material platform in this world, one of four things will happen. Number one, you try to find happiness through material things and you don't get it. Frustration. Or, scenario two, you try to be happy through material things, you achieve that thing, but then it's not what you thought it was, was going to be like. Frustration. Or scenario number three, you try to be happy through something material, you get it, it's good, but then it fades. Frustration. Or scenario number four, you try to be happy through material things, you get it, it's good, and it remains, but then there's some negative thing that comes along with it that you didn't want. Frustration. Now, I challenge anyone in the room to name me one type of material happiness that isn't subjected to one of these four things. Can you name anything? For example, the football player, if it's temporary and he has all these problems, yes, but even if he is retired, he can maybe remember, oh, I was such a great football star. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he can while he's sitting in his chair with many diseases and uh, onslaughts of material old age and you know hardly being able to eat anything because all his teeth has fallen out and <laughs> so ultimately still subjected to material misery so it's like you can be the top of division two but you're still in division two. So if you want division one happiness, that spiritual happiness. So people say like, I want to achieve this. This will be the most amazing thing. And it's good, but it's the top of division two. It's still a lower division of happiness. Because all material happiness will be subjected to these kind of the four things that I just mentioned. And ultimately, those things will never bring you real fulfillment. Something will always be missing. If you, like one person once said to me, I only need three things to be happy. Time, money, and good health. So I said, when you're young, you have time, and you have good health, but you have no money. <laughs> I said, when you grow up and you, you're in your middle age, you have money, you have good health, but you have no time. And when you're old, you've got plenty of time, lots of money in the bank, but you don't have good health. In other words, the world is wired in such a way that if you try to find happiness, something will always be missing. So, therefore Krishna says, this is the king of all knowledge because it's revealing to you uh, another path. We're looking for the right thing, but we're looking in the wrong place. That's what the Bhagavad Gita is revealing. That's why Raja Vidya Raja Guyam Pavitram Vidumutamam. That's why we're meant to grasp spiritual knowledge. Spiritual knowledge is meant to orientate us to understand where real happiness is to be found. But nowadays people say like, oh Bhagavad Gita, religion, spiritual wisdom, I'll do that when I'm old. In other words, they then live a life which is not orientated by spiritual vision. And therefore, they live their whole life trying to find happiness uh, in a place where happiness is not to be found. 
And so if you want to know where to find happiness, if you want to know how to find happiness, and if you want to know who you have to connect with to find the deepest type of happiness, all of that knowledge is contained within the Bhagavad Gita. And therefore, uh, it's the king of all education. Because if you learn all other things, but you don't learn this, it was basically a waste of time. <coughs> That's basically what it is. Yes. So, uh, my question is like some of us are aspiring devotees, maybe aspiring sannyasis. Uh, oh, that's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> we should exchange numbers at the end of this <laughs> program. We can help you on the journey. what one should be ready to give away to take this path and how to permanently settle within this knowledge without deviation I want you to share your personal experience and uh, what is world like from a sannyasi from your perspective thank you wow <laughs> <laughs> you and me should talk <laughs> Uh, the first thing I want to mention is that in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna actually explains who is a sannyasi. Anashita karma phalam karyam karma karotiya sa sannyasi cha yogi cha naniragne na cha In essence, I'm just kind of saying it in modern day language, but what Krishna is basically saying here is that a sannyasi is not understood by their dress. A sannyasi is not understood by any external sign. A sannyasi is someone who has given up all selfishness. A sannyasi is one whose activities are dedicated towards the divine. And in that sense, one may be living in the world, one may have a family, one may have a job, one may... Uh, function within the world and still actually be the greatest sannyasi. A sannyasi is not someone who dresses in orange. Uh, a sannyasi is not someone who carries one of these sticks for self-defense. <laughs> <laughs> that is not a sannyasi in essence. The essence of a sannyasi is one who lives selflessly. So if you, for example, tomorrow get married, you have children, you have a job, but you use all of that, you interact with all of that only for the purpose of service to, to God, then you're actually the greatest sannyasi. Um, maybe more than someone who's externally renounced the world. So that's the first thing we have to understand, that the essence of sannyas is internal, not external. Now, there may be some individuals in the world who decide to externally walk away from it all. Um, and that is possible, if that is your desire. Each one of us have our own path in life. Each one of us have our own personality. So for some of us to interact with the world, to be in family, to have relationships, is very, very natural. But there may be some individuals in the world for whom uh, celibacy, a life of uh, detachment, a life of traveling from place to place and sharing spirituality with people, that comes more naturally. So for me personally, um, I could understand from a young age that... Um, my life was going to go in a different direction. Because somehow or other, the path of interacting with this world uh, just never resonated with my heart. I went to university, I had the opportunity to uh, work in the corporate world. Um, 
I only really ever had one interview in the corporate world. I actually hated to put a suit on. I could never wear a suit. But one time I did it. So I remember going to this one interview. I must have been maybe 20 years old or something. And so I went into the interview and then I came into the office. So then the, I said, I'm here for the interview. So the person said, oh, sit down. So I was sitting in the foyer waiting for this interview. It was at a, like an internet startup, like some kind of corporate place. And I was looking around, because it was an open plan office, I was looking around at all the desks, the people, the atmosphere, and then I heard footsteps. <coughs> and then I just ran out. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was my first and last uh, interview in the corporate world. Uh, I never really made it. Um, so then, yeah, and then when I was 21, I became a monk. And uh, and I, di I, didn't, I didn't know that I'd do it for the rest of my life, but I did it for one year, and then it became five, which became ten, and I guess it's been nearly 25 years now. So, But does that make me any more advanced than any of you? I don't think so. It's just it was my nature. It was my nature to maybe live a different type of life but ultimately God is not impressed by detachment God is not impressed by renunciation but what God is impressed by is someone who has love and so if I look in my heart and I have some love for God then my life is successful and if one of you look in your heart and you have love for God it doesn't matter that you're living in the world and seemingly engaged in so many other activities because the love that you have in your heart means that your, your life is successful. So I think each one of us have to find our calling. Each one of us have to find our path. And what Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita is don't do someone else's path. Sometimes we try to imitate other people's lives. We try to imitate other people's journeys. But what Krishna says is, find your own path. See what resonates most deeply with you. And then learn how to live that path, walk that path, and dedicate it to God in a spiritual way. And, and, and that's what the Bhagavad Gita is teaching us. Does that help in any way? Hello, <laughs> Hare Krishna. Uh, in in your last answer, you explained that all uh, Krishna wants is love by our heart. Uh, but I have a doubt. Uh, can someone really choose to love someone from their heart? Uh, it, love. I feel that love is something which happens naturally and spontaneously. It can happen towards anyone, also towards God. So, if someone is not loving God from their heart, uh, can they really choose to do it? Yeah, nice question. What if we're just not like, we just don't like God? Right? <laughs> what if we just don't feel like it? Um, actually, it said that the soul has unlimited amounts of love to give. And actually the soul has a loving relationship with not just God, but all living beings. The soul can never by default um, be envious uh, or even neutral towards anyone or anything in, when it's pure. When we're looking at people materially, then we see friends and enemies. Then we see people we love and people we don't love. Then we see duality. But when we're actually in our spiritually pure state, 
then we have unlimited amounts of love for everyone and everything. You see, the greatest souls, they even have love for the people who harm them. Isn't it? Because they can see beyond all the coverings. So we naturally love God. We naturally love all living beings. And what we talk about when we say that... Um, uh, what we're talking about in the spiritual process is becoming purified so that we can unleash that love. So it's not like you have to force yourself to love God. All you have to do is remove all of the material layers of illusion that's blocking that flow of love. And when you do that, then it becomes very natural. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you so much. Partially just, I, I guess so, then everyone else can hear. And, uh, so you partially answered my question now, but that's the whole thing. So, yeah. um, I wanted to ask, actually ask, how do we get rid of envy? But you partially answered this question. But to, I had another thought in my mind. I feel like lately, uh, I don't feel envious in, I'm just talking in my personal experience now about somebody having a beautiful house and a beautiful, I don't know, car or anything like that. I feel like I have this envy inside of me that's for devotees having a, doing devotional service that I really want to do and being able to be in holy places when I'm not able to. So how to deal with that? Yeah, so previously we were envious of people out there. <coughs> and nowadays we're envious of people in here. <laughs> That's advancement. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why we envy is because we have uh, the basic misconception that if someone else is doing well, then it means I'm in some way losing out. See, the material world trains us in this way to compete with each other. So that if someone else is doing well, then in some way I'm missing out. If someone is going high, then it means I'm going lower. If someone is getting attention, then it means everyone's going to forget me. Um, so we always have this sense of separating ourselves from others. But actually in the spiritual um, sphere, we see that when others are doing well, when others are striving, when others are um, connecting with God, if we are happy for them, if we uh, appreciate and are grateful for their success, then we also actually share in that success. And this is the whole process of uh, spiritual life, to understand that all of us in this room are not in competition, but all of us in this room are actually interconnected and we can help each other. And so it takes time <coughs> because to be happy when someone else is successful is not so easy. To be compassionate when someone else is struggling, still you can do that. But to be happy when someone else is doing well, that's hard. Um, so we have this envious mentality um, because of comparison and competition. You know the story, right, of the person who the genie came to him and he said, you can have anything you want. And he said, yeah, great. He said, there's only one thing, your neighbor will get double. <laughs> <laughs> so he kind of, uh, that was a little bit of a blow, but somehow or other he managed to blank it out of his consciousness. He said, I'll take the boon anyway. Anyway, then he said, I want one Mercedes. And boom, Mercedes came and then he looked out of the window and the neighbor had two. <laughs> he said, I want a five-story mansion. Boom. And he looked out of his fifth story and he looked up and there was 10 <laughs> on his neighbor. And he said, oh my God. And then he said, Jeannie, I want to go blind in one eye. 
That's envy. Because what we then begin to do is measure our success thinking that we're competing against someone else. See? So over time we begin to realize if others are doing well, let me be happy for them. And in that happiness, um, we rise with them. They take us with them. It's not a race, it's not a competition. And therefore what the devotee does is, in order to overcome their envy is they try to serve. Serve the people you're envious of. It's hard. <laughs> but it's actually very beautiful because it, after some time you begin to realize I'm not against them. We're in this together. And you actually transform your envy into appreciation. So envy is nothing other than appreciation. It's like you see something good that someone's doing or achieving. But it's just seeing the good, but then wishing you had it and that they don't have it. So all we need to do now is appreciate the good and say that, you know, if I share in their success, then I'm also part of it. We're all in it together. Yeah, okay, someone who hasn't asked. Riksha Maharaj, thank you very much for the wonderful class. Maharaj, I have a question. So, uh, you said that this knowledge is revealed uh, when the heart is humble, uh, humble right? <coughs> so, uh, how to practice humility? By practicing devotion service, uh, does humility automatically comes, Or you have to strive for humility also? And especially for someone who are working in material world and spending a lot of their time, more than 50% in material world, and there is cutthroat competition, you, it's very difficult to be always humble. And while coming to temple, we, we try to be humble as much as possible. So, so how would be it I mean, possible? Is this sufficient that once when we can become humble in due course of time? And especially like when someone comes new to Krishna consciousness, so I felt that he he is more humble he, in in a way that he is very very humble, right? But with the due course of uh, time, uh, that humility is not uh, there anymore. So in other piece, Nitena, you could uh, feel yourself at a very initial stage, but uh, with due course of time, that uh, was uh, does not resonate uh, with you. So what you can suggest on humility and how to practice? I guess the most practical way to become humble is to learn to be a servant in every situation. We don't always feel humble, but what we can do is we can take the humble position. And what is the humble position? The position of being a servant. So when you're a leader, Think about how to serve everyone around you and then you'll remain humble as a leader. If someone is undergoing some pain, then think, how can I serve this person to help them in their pain? Then you'll become humble. If there's something that needs to be done in the temple, then think, how can I serve to fill the gap? Then you'll become humble. In other words, the main and most practical way to become humble in this world is you're not going to do it by some mental adjustment. But the way you become humble is by taking yourself out of the center and thinking about how in every situation I can contribute as a servant. And so humility is the absence of the enjoying spirit and the presence of the service spirit in all situations. And in the beginning, it's easier to do it because everything is new, everything is fresh, everyone knows more than you, and you just feel naturally, externally, very, very small. But then later on, when you become more established, more familiar, that humility has to go deeper into one's heart. 
because now <coughs> externally you can't do it just externally because you've become established now and therefore um, yes I, I think the main thing is to always just try to be a servant they say humility does not to th uh, does not mean to think of yourself as less it means to think less of yourself <coughs> does that make sense it doesn't mean you think I'm like I'm nothing but what it means is that you think less of yourself you think more of others and you put others first and you become a servant that's one diamond right? some some thoughts Okay, I'll go for someone who hasn't asked the question and then Lara can go as well. Maharaj, my question was why it is so difficult in this life for when you reach to a end of a stage it realizes that material enjoyment was not ultimate than uh, Raja Vidya acquiring means Raja Vidya uh, finding out the intimate relationship with our God is most important. Why someone has to go through that journey to realize that at later point? We are, we are not like a special soul, of course, like you are born. But how is so difficult in this, in this life to realize at that moment only at the end when we are in like point of death or just before death, when we have passed through all of things in our life and uh, not in between or earlier stage. In spite of having knowledge, in spite of practicing it, uh, we don't realize it. So you're saying sometimes we can read all of this, we can be in the association of devotees, we can understand it all theoretically, but somehow the penny is not dropping. We don't really get it. And why is it that for some of us it takes a whole lifetime to realize this? Is that your question? Yeah. And I feel <coughs> after hearing from you that once someone has got a knowledge of true knowledge of Raja Vidya, It's not necessarily that someone who's a sannyasi or is turned away has understood all of this knowledge or that when you understand this knowledge, that's what you will do. At the end of the Bhagavad Gita, Arjun understood everything that Krishna said, isn't it? Nastamo Hashmriti Labdvat Vat Prasadat Mayachuta Stitosmi Gata Sandeha Karishe Vachanantava. Arjun says at the end of the Gita, my illusion is gone. I understand all the Raja Vidya you've given me, 100%. And then what did Arjun do? He picked up his Gandiva bow, he went on the battlefield, and he continued on as a Kshatriya, but with the transcendental knowledge. So remember, sannyas doesn't mean to just give up everything. Sannyas means to dedicate everything to God. So if you may be in a situation where you can't turn away from the world, you may be in a situation where you have duties, responsibilities, but if you grasp this knowledge, then what you'll understand is that how can now in this situation, how can I dedicate it all to God? How can I connect it all to Krishna? That's bhakti. And uh, how long does it take? It takes as long as uh, depends on your attitude. You see, like all of us are here in this room, and we're all hearing the same thing. The difference between all of us is that when we walk out of this door, we're all going to have decisions to make. Now, how many of us are now going to make decisions in accordance with what we've heard? And how many of us are going to say, great class, but when I make my decision, I don't factor in any of this knowledge. But it was a good class. <laughs> but, you know. So that's the difference. 
if you take this knowledge and you walk out of the door and you apply it, then you'll become realized very, very quickly. But the problem is that most people come, most of us come and we just keep hearing, but it doesn't translate into any change in our life. So then it's like, imagine like I gave you a cookbook and you just kept reading the pages all day. <laughs> I mean like, it's nice, but <laughs> I mean at some point you have to start getting the ingredients and get in the kitchen and do something with it, right? Then you really taste. You're not going to taste the dish just by reading the recipe again and again. It's like it's nice to look at the pictures in a cookbook. But at some point, it's, it's not going to... You need to taste it. And how do you taste it? You have to get the ingredients and start cooking. So if you want to understand this knowledge, you have to live it. You have to do something with it. Therefore, pratyaksha vagamam dharmyam. You can realize all of this. But you have to live it. So that's all of us have the opportunity. Uh, you're a young man. So you, got, you, you have so much. You can be so creative in your life still. You can make a very spiritual life for yourself. The opportunity is there. But you have to be strong. You, you see, if you really want to do spiritual life, you have to be brave. If you really want to practice this, you have to be very courageous. If you really want to do this properly, you're going to have to take some risk in your life. Because to really live this, you're going to have to break away from some of the trends of the material world. And how many people are willing to do that? Most people just want to go along with the flow. But if you're brave, then you can do it. So right now in a moment, I'm a patient. As a doctor, a spiritual doctor, I wanted to ask you, I'm in a situation where uh, after when going, th going through through the journey of uh, spiritual life, <coughs> sometimes I feel to give up my life entirely for spiritual. Suddenly, after two three hours, I realize no, it's not a. It's not practical. And this psychologically keeps happening. It. The same thing happened to Arjun. You are in parampara. Because Arjun, how many times does he tell Krishna, Krishna, I just want to leave the battlefield. Krishna, I just want to walk away from it. Krishna, I just want to go to the forest. Arjun was in the same position. So you are finding your inner Arjun. You are also going through the same thing. You're looking at the world and you're thinking, how can I relate all of this to my Krishna consciousness? It seems like going in a different direction. Arjun was looking at the battlefield. He was thinking, how can I relate all of this fighting to being spiritual? It's completely different. But Krishna told him how to connect it all. <coughs> so in the beginning you may feel like that, but as you become more mature, you'll be able to understand how to connect everything in your life. And living in the world and following your dharma, you'll also become very advanced. Once they, the one man, he came to Socrates and he said, I don't know whether I should get married or not. So Socrates looked at him and he said, definitely you should get married. <laughs> he said, wow, you're so like convinced. Like why? So Socrates <coughs> says, if you have a good marriage, you'll be very happy. And if your marriage is a little bit difficult, don't worry. You'll become a philosopher like me. <laughs> <laughs> so one way or the other, 
when you live in the world and you go through the ups and downs of it all, you'll come out a very wise man. Thank you so much, Maharaj. I'm really happy that you came back to Berlin. I'm not the only one, I don't know. Uh, I would like to ask something about self-discipline. Um, so how and why is self-discipline important um, for building a stronger um, connection with Krishna? I mean, it's a little rhetorical question, <laughs> but still I'm interested in. Um, because for me, I, I listen to you and it's really like, I, I, I hear you and I, I really try to build up a constant, um, yeah, like commitment to mm -hmm. whatever there is, like is it sadhana or, or reading, but then there is, and I know also that knowledge, of course, it frees us from the material, like from the material desires and everything, but it's still very hard and I don't know how to build up this self-discipline and I was uh, wondering if you have any <laughs> advice on this. Yeah, discipline is uh, one of the most difficult things because the mind uh, rebels against discipline. <laughs> the first battle of the day is the battle with our own mind. And the idea is that if you can win that battle, then every other battle in life becomes much easier to win. But how do we develop that strength of discipline to fight against the mind when it wants to rebel? So there are a few different things that can help you to develop your self-discipline. The first thing is association. Somehow or other, you've got to develop friendship and closeness with individuals who have that, <coughs> who live that, and who are um, experiencing the beauty of that self-discipline. Because when you're close to them and you see that, um, you just see, like, if you live with someone who's very disciplined, uh, naturally, and they're, and they're doing it in a happy spirit, Naturally, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll go along with them. You'll benefit from their energy. So that's definitely one thing. The other thing that helps with self-discipline is to live a life in sattva. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that there are different modes of nature. There's ignorance, there's passion, and there's goodness. So the more that you live a life in sattva, in goodness, your food is in sattva, your environment is in sattva, your daily lifestyle is in sattva, you wake up early in the morning when sattva is strong, you, uh, everything you do is in sattva, your environment is clean, all of these kind of things, then what happens is the mind becomes strengthened by sattva. But when you live in ignorance and passion, then the mind becomes more and more agitated and uncontrolled. And therefore, living in the mode of goodness can really, really help you to develop more, uh, better discipline. The third thing that helps with discipline is just try to make small changes to your life first. Many, many small wins. When you try to be disciplined, in something manageable, um, then what happens is when you're able to do it, then your confidence grows. And then you're able to be dis disciplined in bigger things and make bigger commitments. And so what happens over time is that you grow your ability to be disciplined, to be focused, to be committed, to take vows, um, because you're building your capacity. So sometimes we underestimate uh, the small changes, the small disciplined things that we do, or how over time they can transform your character. You see, like one person, he said, we underestimate what we can achieve in five years, and we overestimate what we can achieve in one year. Because basically, we just try to change ourselves like immediately in one go. 
and we overestimate our capacity. But we underestimate what we can do in five. If you do many, many small things for a long time, you'll be a changed person. You know, but because we want to experience that shift very, very quickly, then we. So these are some things that are there. Um, and then ultimately, what helps us to be more disciplined is inspiration. Uh, when we have, s when we're more and more captivated by that great thing that we're aiming for, that requires us to be disciplined, then when we're more and more inspired by that goal, then we're ready to do more and more whatever it takes to reach that goal. And so therefore we have to constantly be investing in becoming more and more uh, attracted and inspired by um, our ultimate goal. So th I guess these are some things, I hope some of those things help. <coughs> I don't know how we're doing for time, because we have a few more days, so shall we uh, <laughs> be disciplined and... Uh, I, I'm okay, whatever you, Lekha Shavanti or Janitai, you tell us what we should do. <laughs> because then there's Prashadam as well. Yeah, yeah. Make, make one, one Maybe one or two questions and then we'll come. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So, like, relating to what... Uh, yeah, so, relating to what uh, the situation Arjuna is in, mm, uh, I have experienced and I have also witnessed this, that people like here, Maharaj, uh, Prabhuji is also willing to take up life of sannyasi. Uh, so, with due respect, no, what I'm trying to say is that these people should have their choice, and they should do it because more the better. But as a, as for my experience and as uh, the current world that we live in, it's difficult for them to uh, take up that responsibility and most importantly I identify themselves as, uh, with that kind of responsibility. Uh, so naturally, somehow for us needs to take the responsibility of protecting them and creating a world who, you know, where they could have that choice. Uh, in that method, let's just say that we need to amass wealth for that, we need to be cunning for that, we be suspect politically inclined for that, so that we could create a world where such people could have that kind have of that opportunity. Yeah. Now, the, um, like I have made that the aim of my life though, but uh, in that process, I fear that the space that I have for Krishna and Mahaprabhu, I don't want to lose it. For now, all I do is learn Gita by heart. I make sure I do my six month rounds, but I don't get the association because I'm home learning, studying hard, so that right now my current goal is amassing wealth and then eventually, you know, become powerful enough to protect Vaishnavas in general. So how do I make sure that I don't lose this space? So eventually when it is time and I come back and I pursue this as the ultimate goal of life, how do I have that space at that point of time? Yeah, thank you so much. So um, you personally won't take sannyas, but you want to live in the world and you want to earn and support people who do want to do that. And while you earn and try to get ahead in this world, sometimes you have to be a little cunning, sometimes you have to engage with people in the world, and that may mean that you know, you're know you to some extent getting materially affected by that. Mm. So how can you rise in this world to be materially successful and at the same time keep your good spiritual consciousness so that you don't, you know, because the Bible says, what profit the man who gains the whole world but loses their soul? So you don't want to lose your soul in the process. That's the point. Let's just say I don't want to lose Mahaprabhu. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's why uh, to have a time every single day which is dedicated towards spiritual practice is absolutely essential. 
It doesn't matter whether you're a sannyasi or whether you're a grihasta or whether you're working in the corporate world or giving lectures on the Bhagavad Gita every single day. It doesn't matter who you are. There should be some time every single day when every single person uh, just connects with God, just connects with Krishna. This is called sadhana. And what we tell everyone is that every single day, ideally if you can, early morning, set aside half an hour, set aside one hour, and in that one hour, <coughs> chant Krishna's names. In that one hour, read Bhagavad Gita. In that one hour, set your intention and remember your highest principles. And what happens is when you go in and you strengthen your inner world, then when you come out to engage with the external world, you will be able to influence the world without being influenced by the world. But in order to go out and influence the world without being influenced, first you have to spend some time strengthening your inner world. And so therefore every single day you should do some spiritual activity. And you should uh, do that ideally at the same time every single day. 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. or 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. or 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. <coughs> Whatever you can do. But uh, spend that time. And then you will go through this world. You'll be successful. But you'll always also be remembering what is your ultimate goal that you're aiming towards. Does that make sense? Here, this uh, okay. you get the last question. Hare Krishna, Maharaji. It's on, it's on. It's on. It's on. Um, so, I have a very unique relation with Krishna because I that's my feeling because I was born in Mathura and uh, now I'm here. I feel so unlucky to be here because I was born at the right place. But uh, I really want to know uh, if Krishna is angry with me. How can I know that? How can I know what he feels about me? So uh, we are all here. We have a relationship with Krishna. How can we know whether Krishna is pleased with what we're doing? How do we know that we're making the right decisions? How do we know that uh, the way my life is turning out um, is in line with Krishna's plan for me? The first thing is when we study scripture. Because when we study scripture, then what will happen is you'll understand all the principles that Krishna is recommending we live our life by. And then it will be very clear to you, am I living by this? Am I making my decisions according to what Krishna is saying? Am I, uh, do I have the character that Krishna wants me to have? Um, so when we read the scripture, we understand more about how Krishna wants us to live our life. And then you'll be much more uh, aware. Um, because you'll know, when I live according to this, then I'm living according to Krishna's plan. And when I'm living according to Krishna's plan, then Krishna is happy. And then the other way we understand whether Krishna is happy with us is by um, asking Krishna's devotees those who are close to Krishna, those who um, can help you to apply all of this to your life so you can come to them and you can ask them, this is how I'm living, this is what I'm doing, what do you think, do you think Krishna would be happy with this? And by their advice, by their guidance, by their um, wisdom, we can also understand uh, whether Krishna is happy with us or not. And then, you know, ultimately, you're a sincere soul. 
to just go in front of Krishna. This is Krishna. See, this is Krishna Jagannath who is uh, in ecstasy. And so you can go in front of Krishna. And if you're very sincere, and if you're very honest, then you can come in front of Krishna and say, Krishna, are you happy with me? And Krishna is in your heart. He will tell you. So, yes, this is a question we should always be asking. Um, is Krishna happy with me? Is Krishna pleased with how I'm living my life? Um, that's a very beautiful question to ask. And uh, through these means, you can understand but I think the fact that you ask that question means Krishna is pleased with you. <laughs> because only a sincere person would ask such a question. So, But we can all improve. So may you please Krishna more and more. And we're very happy to know there's someone in the room who was born in Krishna's backyard. <laughs> That's very nice. Thank you. Very nice question. All right, everyone. So thank you so much. These were just some uh, thoughts. We had a little bit of discussion here. Um, and yeah, look forward to connecting over the next few days. All the best. Srila Prabhupada ki. Bhagavad Gita ki.